Okay, welcome to my talk. My name is Christian Follini. I have 15 years of production experience running mod security, and I'm a co lead of the OWASP mod security Coral Set. Uh, so, as it goes, I'm no longer an attacker. So, unless the exciting talks we just heard, that is going to be relatively boring because this is a blue team talk in blue font and we try to defend stuff and it's unfortunately a very boring work and I'm sorry you have to endure this before lunch because everybody wants to go to lunch but there is my talk and we'll see. Okay, uh, let's get going. Uh, mod security is a web application firewall. The OWASP mod security core rule set is a rule set on a web application firewall. Now web application firewall that's highly commercial, it's highly contested, it's a lot of web revert, it's a lot of bullshit around. And there is a single open source offering that is, in my opinion, because I'm leading one of these projects, is very different for the commercial offerings because this actually brings value at a relatively decent cost while all the commercial competition is very expensive and as we'll see, is not bringing any value. We're looking at internet voting here, which is kind of, at least in theory, should be high security. And the only way to pull off a high security setup with the help of a web application firewall is the OS mod security core rule set. Not only in my opinion, but that's also what my customers wanted. Uh, I came to the conclusion, this is our only way to protect this. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to introduce you to this core rule set project. I'm going to introduce you to internet voting in Switzerland which has a long and adventurous history. And we're going to apply this for a high security setup. Good. Um, now, as I said, web application firewalls uh, are highly contested. They add some value if done right or not. They were pushed around 2005 and the PCI DSS standards, a payment card industry standard enforced having a web application firewall. They're not forcing you to run it. They're not forcing you to configure it successfully. They're not forcing you to protect anything, but you have, just need to have it. And that's what my, that is what the industry of web application firewalls is actually addressing. They just give you something and then we'll see. Um, still, web application firewalls are used in a way, they use a seat belt in a car, and I advocated to use as use a seat belt in a car, uh, because you're not driving around with a seat belt and the idea, hey, I'm immune to car crashes now. If I'm going to a crash, nothing will happen to me. No, that's not the case. The case is they give you decent baseline protection should the bad thing happen. Should you end up in a car accident, then you're better off with a seat belt. And that's the same thing with a decent web application firewall. It's no protection. It's no silver bullet for security. You still have to fix your source code. You still have to patch your systems. However, when you have a bug, and chances are you have a bug, even Apache has a bug, and even Solaris still has bugs after 30 years of development, 40 years actually, I think. So uh, chances are that your application are equally having bugs. So putting a new security layer in front with decent configuration will actually improve your security posture. It's no silver bullet, but it buys you time. And chances are, if an attacker is attacking you and he sees that you're well protected with the WAF and he cannot even attack the backend system, he'll walk off to the competing system, to your competition actually, to the other bank around the corner, or maybe to the different country with their internet voting. Uh, Ideally. So that's why you use a web application firewall, not because it's perfect, because it's good return on investment. Okay, so we had introduction talk on Apache already. I'm using mod security on Apache. Uh, in Antonio's presentation, there were third party modules on the bottom on the right side. Uh, mod security is one of these. So mod security is a module that you add to uh, Apache and it turns Apache, an Apache reverse proxy or gateway server into a web application firewall. So that's a third party module to put on top. Uh, there is a lot of competition, as I said, there are 80 
uh, commercial offerings around the globe, or the last time I checked, uh, there was a list of about 80 of them. I would say half of them are probably based on mod security. So that is people had an existing product, typically a load balancer or something, and then customers act for more security and say, hey, we need a WAF now. How can we get a WAF? Uh, let's take mod security and put it on top of a load balancer. Now we have a WAF offering for the huge market. So that you, that's how you end up with the AT uh, global commercial offerings, web application firewalls, half of them probably based uh, in mod security. And very often that's all they do. They just put mod security hands off. You're a customer, you're in charge now. Uh, so mod security is, uh, is a decent piece of engineering. It's, uh, it gives you granular control down to the byte level. So it inspects the traffic coming into the web server, going out of the web server. It's built for Apache, but it's running an alternative system as well. You can run it on Nginx successfully these days. And it does pattern matching. HTTP requests, as Antonio demonstrated, uh, it applies regular expressions or other rules to the requests. And then if it sees something bad, then it can react. It's relatively simple uh, in theory. And in practice, of course, it's, it's horrendous. It's really complicated. It's ugly stuff. It's ugly regular expressions. We have regular expressions that spread thousands of bytes. And you don't want to read them by hand. That's really rough. Uh, but mod security is, is uh, transparent. Uh, there is no artificial intelligence here. This is not crowd enabled. This is not gen next generation. This is just, it's like a clock in the end. It's a lot of wheels and you have tiny screwdrivers that you adjust stuff. So you can get the hang of this. You can understand this. And if you don't, then uh, you can join one of my courses. I teach people mob security usage. So that's the baseline. That's the engine. And now we're putting uh, rules on top. And this is when the OWASP mod security core rule set comes in. So we have the engine, and now we need the rules on top. Uh, most people uh, don't want to write the rules themselves. That's relatively complicated. and ruling. The rule language is really annoying. So uh, they take a standard rule set. And the most widespread rule set is the core rule set, the OWASP core rule set. Um, I said half of the commercial offerings are based on mod security. And I would say two thirds of the commercial offerings on the globe are using CRS, meaning uh, mod security is only the engine. I mean, you can replace the engine with an alternative implementation and still run the same rules. And that's what a lot of commercial offerings are doing. They hate mod security for various reasons. It's resource hawk. It does a lot of things that you're not interested in. So you can do it a leaner implementation that's still able to run CRS. Uh, so we have like two thirds of the commercial market running CRS, and it would be nice if these commercial offerings would sponsor our projects in case you have to work for one of these. Uh, so that's the Coral set. I'm running this project uh, together with several friends, and we have Andrea in the second row. He's one of our team. Hey, Andrea. <laughs> Good. So does it actually help? Yeah, it does. What you see here is Burp attacking a vulnerable application. The application has lots of bugs on purpose because it's meant to test security scanners. The idea is to run the security scanner against a vulnerable application and then see how many of the bugs can Burp discover. Uh, here, Burp did 4.5 million requests. That's a really strong Burp. It's a pumped up Burp with lots of plugins enabled, and the guy running Burp was really an expert. And he discovered around 40 bugs here. A thousand requests uh, reported a bug and behind these thousand findings were then 40 individual, re um, individual bugs in the application discovered. In the second column, you can see a default CRS installation. That's the five minute installation. That's the opt get install or a git clone installation of CRS. Mod security is installed, rules on top, and then we run the same 4 million requests again, and you see that over 80% of the vulnerabilities can no longer be exploited. Uh, a vulnerability class that Burp is not able to exploit anymore is SQL injection, for example. Now, I'm not promising you that uh, this is removing SQL injection. Of course not. It's merely hiding it. And I'm not promising you that a skilled attacker, a persistent attacker, is not able to exploit SQL bugs anymore. 
Antonio and Marco would still be able to pull this off, but they would have to invest a lot more time. Maybe not two weeks, but let's say a couple of days, and they would probably already give up in the meantime. So a standard software vulnerability scanner is no longer able to exploit existing bug, which buys you time, of course. Situations are a bit different with cross-site scripting because they're harder to detect, they're harder to protect against. And uh, while as the local file inclusions here and not uh, present in this vulnerable application are remote command execution bugs, they're relatively easy to detect for us, even if the best shell is really a pain in the ass. Uh, but we're pretty good on that side cross site scripting a bit weak, but the general rule of thumb is what can be detected in HTTP traffic, we do detect by at least 80% of the cases. There are numerous uh, exploit cheat sheets around for cross site scripting, uh, payload all the things is a famous GitHub repository uh, that lists a lot of payloads, and we generally do like 80, 90% by default. And by default is, of course, not yet high security, as you imagine. Uh, for a high security setup, we want to be more aggressive with the rules. And this is where the additional columns come in. And uh, we call this paranoia levels. And a default installation gives you baseline security. And then we're adding more rules in higher paranoia level. This goes up to four. And the more rules you get, the more aggressive the rule becomes and the more false positives you're getting. So it's like in a Decent uh, and default installation, you, we try to keep you without false positive. Your application is supposed to continue to run. But then if you have a bigger security appetite, then we're adding more aggressive rules for you. And that brings you false positives. Uh, good. Here is a, is a report uh, from Thomas McConnell. Yeah, he's a Finnish guy. He compared several offerings. Uh, cloud offerings based on CRS or not based on CRS and their, their efficiency against, um, against standard attacks. Thousands of attack requests, it's not 4 million as in the Burp case, but 10, 15,000 requests. By the way, I'm linking all the resources here on my Twitter account, so you may want to follow it. And I've scheduled the, the tweets, so you have the links there, you don't have to type them. Um, so uh, he is confirming uh, if you see the red dot, the SQL injection line, the third line here, I told you Burp is no longer able to pull this off. And he, he reports an efficiency with Google Cloud Armor based on CRS of 90-90%. So the second column to the end, this one. So this is almost the same that we reported in the previous slide. SQL injection is re really good if you're using uh, a CRS-based CloudWAF offering. However, if you're going with the ABS WAF or the Fortinet managed WAF, that's the commercial competition. And they're, they're really violet or red originally. We have a bit of colors here. So they go like 20% of SQL injections detected. And you pay money for this. While as this, uh, the, CR, the naked CRS offerings for free, and it does 99%. So uh, choose wisely here. So why is that? Why are commercial solutions so widely worse than the open source solution. And if you choose an open source solution based on a commercial offering, you have to make sure that the commercial offering is not crippling you. I don't know what Cloudflare is doing with the remote command execution, but we're pretty good. And they crippled this at 23% of the detection rate. I don't know what these guys are doing. Uh, but uh, you really need to evaluate this when you're choosing one of this. Why, why is that happening? Uh, I need to tell you a little story here. And you probably know the story, but I'm putting it in a new context. We start with a boy. And this explains why the commercial competition is so bad. So we start with a boy, and the boy has some sheep. You know where it is going. So the guy has to go to the pasture with the sheep and protect them as a shepherd. And then the wolf comes in. The wolf's probably wearing a dark hoodie, and he wants to eat the sheep. So he's the attacker. And... The idea is that the boys raises the alarm, and then the hunters come, track down the wolf, and have a big party in the village. Everybody's happy. Wolf is tracked down. Well, of course, the wolf is not happy, but everybody else is very happy. And that's what, you're, what the promise is when you buy a WAF, of course. Now, the problem is 
the wolf on its detection and the alarm. Because you, you can never really, really tell if the wolf is real or not, or if it's a false alarm. If your pattern matching identified a real attack, or if it was a false alarm, something resembling an attack. As it comes, this is really hard. It's really hard to do this in HTTP traffic. There are obvious cases, but then there are a lot of not so obvious cases. And developers do crazy things to their code. So it's hard to tell if it's a real attack or if it's not. If it's a real attack, we call this a true positive. And that's nice. Everybody's happy in that situation. The problem, of course, is if the boy calls wolf and there is no wolf, then the system administrator will be pissed. Security team will be really pissed. And you do this se several times, and then they switch off the buff. And that's really bad. And we do this in a quantitative measure. False alarms can be thousands. You can have 50,000 false alarms on, on a standard application a single day. So that's really bad. And we earn that side. CRS does that. We do false alarms. Why do we false alarms? Because the alternative is even worse. The alternative is a false negative. The wolf is coming and no alarm. And why is the commercial competition erring on that side? I tell you, I explain it to you why. If the commercial vendor installed this for you, you're installing a commercial solution, and then the boss or one very important customer is blocked by the WAF because of a false alarm. Traffic is blocked, benign traffic, traffic is blocked, that person is going to be extremely pissed. And the commercial vendor is risking to lose you as a customer. They're no longer prolonging the license. They stop using the product. They're stopping giving money to the vendor because of a false positive. That is a direct impact. Block the CEO and your solution is out, of course. One of the false negative is the wolf gets in and eats the sheep. And who is going to blame the WAF? Nobody's going to blame the WAF. They're going to blame the application developers. And if you have been exploited successfully, the last thing that you're going to do is stopping the WAF. What you're going to do is throw more money at the WAF. So I think uh, there is a strong commercial interest in avoiding false positive at all costs and there's relatively little commercial interest in providing a functional WAF. Now, the, uh, the point with the open source coral set is entirely different. Our skin in the game is different. We're not making money on this product. If you have false positive, we try to help you, but we're never going to do a compromise on the detection rate because of a false positive. So we're in for higher education for system administrator. Security officers should understand the solution. We have guides for you. We have documentation to avoid false positives. But we're not compromising on the detection rate because our money is not in here. It's only our spare time and our reputation to be the strongest web application firewall out there on the internet. So what can you do exactly? Uh, where's that slide? Yeah, this slide. False positives. So what can you do? Uh, you have to expect false positive in the default installation, but namely at paranoia level two, when you have a higher security appetite. As soon as you have real data involved, we suggest you enable paranoia level two. And then at paranoia level three, that is aimed for uh, more like online banking. And then paranoia level four for stuff like nuclear power plants or internet voting, if you go. And then you need to work around this false positive and you do this with so-called rule exclusion. So include, exclude a certain rule for your service in a certain situation or a certain URI is not applying that rule for an individual parameter, uh, perhaps. So these are rule exclusions. And you write this by hand or you use a software like CREX and NEA.com that we developed for you in my company. You find lots of tutorials and my website and NEA.com and you join one of my courses. Good. So you have four paranoia levels up to nuclear power plant level, or we scratched up for this presentation and call this the internet voting level security. Apparently, this is advanced, this is rough, this is a lot of testing, and this is no default installation anymore. Good. I'm summing this up. Uh, the always coral set is the first line of defense against web application attacks. It's a generic set of deny rules. So it's generic, it works everywhere. 
it blocks at least 80% of application attacks by default. So when you read the OS top 10, we do like 80% of that stuff. Uh, paranoia levels can push this up into the plus 95% region. And you retain granular control over your entire traffic down on the byte level. First part of my talk. Now let's move over to the internet voting in Switzerland. Uh, so this is how internet, or no, this is how physical voting works in Switzerland. You go to the voting office and place your ballot. Uh, but that is not what Swiss are doing. Over, far over 90% are using mail-in ballots because we're a semi-direct democracy where we vote at least four times a year. So we're not electing a parliament four times a year, but we do yes-no referendums constantly. Um, actually, tomorrow is a yes-no referendum in to allow um, a marriage for gay people. For homosexuals, they get marriage tomorrow by a margin of probably 60, 70% yes vote is expected. That's happening tomorrow. If we do this four times a year, so this is a streamlined process and everybody's all constantly in election or referendum mode, and we do this by mail. And mail comes with a, a lot of problems. This is a, a process a design. It was the first really mapping of the mail ballot voting process in Switzerland by a friend of mine called Christian Killer. That's his real name, Christian Killer, and his professor, Mr. Stiller. They developed this process. Um, look up the paper. Don't try to read the small font here. Uh, it's super complicated. And of course, it has a lot of security weaknesses. Mail-in ballots, even in Switzerland, have security weaknesses. And what is protecting us, it's so de decentralized. You would have to exploit hundreds of thousands of voting offices probably uh, to provide or exploit the process. Good. This is how an election ballot for a real uh, election looks like in Switzerland. It's probably familiar to you. I don't know. A specialty in Switzerland, you can edit stuff. You can strike through names. You can put in your friends. Uh, you can do all sorts of things on an election ballot in Switzerland. It makes it very complicated. And of course, it makes it very complicated to count it. Because if you count this by hand, you see how error prone that is. Bonus points if you spot the content manager from Butwill. Uh, next slide. Uh, and of course, if we move to internet voting, so we take the mail in thing and then we move to internet, then this becomes inherently insecure. I mean, we don't need Bruce to tell us that you cannot really do internet voting in a secure way. That is, uh, this quote by Bruce Schneier. Uh, sums up all the counter arguments against inter-voting, internet voting. And the core argument is you want to have voting secrecy. You want to make sure that everybody gets a secret vote that rests in the secret ballot. And if the ballot is not secret, then you can beat up your neighbor because he voted for the wrong party, or you can pay somebody to, to vote for your party uh, and prove it by confirming that he really or she really voted for the party. And that is really bad. So we need secret ballot in a democracy. And of course, we need to encrypt this. And when we encrypt this to get the secret ballot, then it's very hard to prove that the election was done properly, to redo account, to redo the tallying and make sure, hey, this was a clean election. So we have two contradictions. We want secrecy with encryption and we want transparency without any encryption. And that doesn't go together as Bruce put it very famously. So there are very good arguments against internet voting. Uh, as it happens with all complicated things in life, there are all the good arguments in favor of internet voting. Here's the Swiss perspective. The first one is we have a ton of citizen living abroad. We have 10% of the voting population not living in Switzerland. Uh, now everybody, or well, not everybody around the globe is profiting for a good post system as Italy or Switzerland. There are people living in South America, Asia, and they just shrug at the idea of mail in balance, uh, paper letters being transmitted and arriving in time never works. If you happen to live in Mexico, voting a Swiss election, give up immediately. It's, you're never going to get it. You get the voting material by mail the moment the voting is already over. And the process takes four, uh, you have, four, they send out the letter four weeks in advance and it's never getting there, uh, let alone being returned. So forget about that. And it's 10% of the voting population. Disenfranchising 10% of the voting population 
is relatively rough. That's a lot of people. Uh, so internet voting becomes more attractive, doesn't it? Then we have handicapped people, visually impaired or quadriplegics, those people who cannot fill in a, a ballot on paper. They need an assistant. Do they get a secret ballot? No. The assistant writes it for them. And the blind person is not able to check on the assistant. Depending on the municipality that you're living, the municipality sends the assistant. You see where I'm taking this. And that is wrong on a constitutional level. Everybody is guaranteed the secret ballot, but not the blind people. So internet voting with a screen reader, proper hardware equipment, makes internet voting, again, more attractive on a constitutional level. So they have good arguments in favor of this. Third one, formally invalid ballots. You see how the Swiss ballot look like. And we miscount constantly. They always, if they have to do a recount, they count about half percent of the votes are wrongly counted. And a half percent, it doesn't sound much, but hey, it's substantial. And very often, we have up to 10% of ballots that are invalid. And because of the secret ballot, nobody's telling these people. You can fill out a ballot in the wrong way your, own li your whole life. It's always abandoned. And nobody's ever telling you, hey, you need to do this differently. So invalid ballots are no longer possible on a conceptual level because there is a GUI and you click and then it's a formally ballot in internet voting. So with elections, if we lose another 10% of the voting population because the ballot is invalid, then we're already disenfranchised 20%. The, the handicapped people are a lot lower probably, but we're talking about the range of 10, 20% of the votes that are abandoned, invalid, not coming on in time or people not even attempting to vote because it's never working from South America. Um, so final point, the security issues of the physical protest. We just had uh, two months ago the biggest voting fraud in Switzerland where an election official uh, replaced uh, 200 ballots in a voting office. Nobody noticed until the party receiving the vote said, hey, hold on, this is not possible. The result is statistically incorrect. You're not telling us that we made this number of votes in that city because that doesn't add up at all. We should have made a different number by a large margin. And politicians refused, of course. Uh, they went on and on and hammered the doors until somebody said, yeah, maybe you're right, let's recount. And then it all blew up. So the boss of the voting office uh, was just judged as the biggest voter fraud ever in Switzerland. And that was physical. That was physical ballots. And when you look at the process I showed you before, that is so complicated. There are lots of weak spots around mail-in ballots uh, on the transport level uh, where you can manipulate votes or steal votes or submit votes for somebody else, etc., etc. And that adds up. It's hard to pull off on a scale, but all combined, these four reasons make internet voting uh, relatively attractive. So Switzerland is investing in internet voting and has been doing so for many, many years. And that is an adventurous tale. Uh, this is all based on, uh, on the Swiss federal organization. Uh, I think Switzerland is even more federally organized than Italy. It's more on the United States level. So we do a ton of things on the province or region level, uh, namely voting. Voting is almost entirely in the authority of the canton, as we call it, or province that you're living in, in Switzerland. So the central government has very little to say in votes and elections, with the exception of internet voting. So when they started to do this like 20 years ago, they thought, hey, we need a general security oversight and we assigned this to the Swiss government or the federal administration. And that was a smart move. Um, as you probably know, in the United States, that's not the case. And there was a lot of discussion last year because federal government has no say whatsoever. In Switzerland, at least the federal government can impose rules on internet voting. And that's a good thing, as we're going to show. So this is the start of our timeline. And 2000 was the first project in Switzerland. And this is running for 20 years, apparently. And uh, to take a bit of the suspense out, we still don't have internet voting in Switzerland. But at least we tried for 20 years. Uh, 2004, uh, Geneva did the first trial. So Geneva is second UN place. 
Uh, and Geneva had this historical mission to bring the world internet voguing. They really understood this as their mission. They brought enlightenment to the event, uh, to the world. They brought Calvinism to the world. So uh, for Protestants, Geneva is very in important. And they thought, we're going to bring internet voting to the world as well. And they made huge investments. Uh, 2008, a Spanish company Seidel entered Switzerland in a canton of Neuchâtel. And 2009, a consortium was founded that um, unified eight Swiss uh, cantons. We have 26 of them, 26 regions. So eight of them joined and commissioned American uh, Unisys, or the Swiss branch, to develop an internet voting system for them. In 2011, uh, the government established a steering committee, a steering board to direct the security regulation. That is very typical for Switzerland. You have cantons doing the first step and government going a bit behind, experimenting phase, and then when they think, yeah, this is ripe now, this is mature, they're bringing federal oversight, and then there was supposed to be two or three years and we settled. But that's not how this turned out. Uh, 2015, government announced the Unisys development you've been working on for six years, eight cantons. It's no good. It's bullshit. They didn't phrase it like that, but they said, it, we need major rewrites in a new security architecture to allow it for federal elections. That was two months ahead of the federal election, so the system died immediately. Everybody abandoned ship. Unisys is dead. Eight cantons without the net voting. Uh, 2016, uh, Swiss Post entered the market and they joined with the Spanish uh, Seidel company from Catalonia. And the, the Spaniards, they are the internet voting experts. They're a commercial internet voting company doing uh, voting around the globe, entering the Swiss market and realizing, oh boy, Switzerland is so complicated. We need a local company to join with us that do, does the operating for us. So that was a very good match. 2016. And when this was coming about, the uh, federal government announced, let's do a mainstreaming attempt. Uh, and 2019, half of the cantons should support this now. And uh, that's not what happened, because 2018, Geneva threw the towel. So after almost 20 years of development, Geneva realized they're no longer able to finance this. So Geneva gave up uh, more or less a year before the federal election, 2019. And, and then they terminated the system two months ahead of the federal election. They said, we're going to support it for the federal election. And the two months ahead, they gave, no, we cannot do this. This is not secure enough. We give up as of today. Huge shock again. And then comes Swiss Post. Swiss Post had to publish their source code and had to run a bug bounty program. So government uh, forced Swiss Post to run a bug bounty program on their internet voting prior to using it in the national election. And this was happening in 2019. Did anybody follow the news around the Swiss Post bug bounty? Yeah, you, you know the headlines, guys, don't you? Yeah, that turned out really well. <laughs> uh, the headlines uh, were a bit rough, but let's get to the good side first. Because the program had two sides, source code publication and bug bounty. The bug bounty, they went to uh, the voting village at DEF CON in the US, and they handed out flyers. They literally did. And they had 3,000 hackers uh, subscribe to the newsletter so they could join the bug bounty with a, a bounty of 50,000 US dollars, or 50, 000, almost 50,000 euros. Uh, so that was good incentive. And finally, around 1,000 hackers actually attempted to exploit it. And here on the left is what they found, 16 findings under best practices. So up here is steal a vote without being detected, 50,000 bucks. Down here is best practice finding 100 bucks. Actually, we raised this, I was part of the project, we raised this to 400 for the most severe bug. The most severe bug that anybody identified was injecting an arbitrary IP address in a log. That is bad and is actually my fault, my misconfiguration, but it's far from intrusion into the system or taking over a system. So this is the headline that never made the headlines. The bug bounty ran really well. And we're going to see why it ran really well. Because the source code publication 
did not nearly as good. These are some of the tweets and the headlines globally for the source code publication. So the researchers find critical backdoor in Swiss online voting system or uh, Swiss cheese, whole found amid public source code audit. Swiss Post puts e-voting on hold after secure, so researchers uncover critical security errors. Again, two months ahead of the election, Swiss, Switzerland lost its online voting system. This was supposed to be running in several cantons. You chalk for them two months ahead of federal election. No internet voting system. Again, some of the cantons were the same as were affected five, uh, four years earlier. So uh, on the one side, you had the live system that could not be exploited. On the other side, you had the source code that looked horribly. Everybody confirmed this is bad code. So what the Spanish company Seidel provided was bad source code and Switzerland, uh, Swiss Post did like this and ran it in production. And they never really saw the source code up to the publication as well. And then they went, ooh, that's a lot worse than we thought. But that was too late and uh, they had kind of had been warned, but then uh, a lot of people telling them that was good stuff. So it was it was a bad awakening for everybody. I expected it to be bad. I did not expect it to be that bad. But then reality is usually harder than you expect. Good. How did, does the story uh, continue? Uh, the whole uh, online voting process had to be rebooted, obviously. that That's not cutting it. And we need to bring in the experts, we need to bring in science, we need to talk to universities and industry experts with this. So Switzerland, uh, Swiss government, together with provinces, commissioned a report. Uh, and I had the honor to run the scientific committee to do this report. So they picked me as a security engineer because I've always been very interested in that stuff, because I've published around that stuff. So of all the people, they picked me to run this committee. And we published a report, this is the URI. If you happen to know anybody working in online voting, send them this URL. Everybody should be reading this report. And the report says, if you wanna do internet voting, this is how you're supposed to do. We cannot guarantee it's going to work, but don't do internet voting without taking this advice into consideration. It's an 80 pages report and it's relatively readable, I think. Good. Uh, so that was uh, the online dialogue, initial research, scientific report, and now new regulation is coming in and it's supposed to be published at the end of this year, and then they want to start a new next year. Summary of internet voting in Switzerland. We've been doing this for 20 years. Uh, Switzerland is a useful testbed because we vote four times a year, so you get a lot of production experience. Uh, it's an iterative process with strict supervision on the federal level, and they're not shy to block production system two months ahead of federal elections. There was an expert dialogue and new regulation in 2021, and new online voting trials are scheduled for next year, probably aiming at half percent of the voting population. So we're very on a low level here, and perhaps we continue like this for another 10 years until we convinced that this time this is really secure enough to use in for larger numbers. Okay, now how do you pull this off? How do you invite 3,000 hackers at DEF CON to attack your system and all they find is 16 low impact bugs? Uh, let's see. Swiss Post. Uh, uh, thankfully, it published a documentation how they pulled this off. It was uh, two weeks ago. So uh, following the scientific dialogue, they were commissioned to be more transparent. You need to tell Swiss citizens what you're doing here. We need full transparency here. We need all the source code permanent. We need your documentation. We need your security audits to raise trust and confidence in the voting population. So they published their concept how to tune the web application firewall. And that's a very useful uh, a document because it explains how to run the OWASC call rule set in production in a high security setting. It's not magic, it's just hard work. And that document explains how to do this. Download it and I've linked it on Twitter as well. Good. And then you wanna tune down to zero. That's the core of this document. You have false positive, of course you have false positive. You enabled crazy rules, you have thousands of false positives. And what do you do? You tune them away. 
you train your rule set to do the way with this. And I was working on a process, as I said, I was working for Swiss Post as a contractor, and they didn't believe me. They didn't believe me that there were false positive, they were real, and we need to tune this, and we need to test this. Like, before we go to production, we really need to test it. Of course, they learned it the hard way. They did a demo in front of a very important politician, and the politician ate a false positive, and he was blocked from voting. The next day, they launched a testing campaign with millions of HTTP requests. They hired a professional test engineer to run millions of requests over several months, and we tuned away every single false positive. And in the end, we ran for two years without a single false positive in production. So for two years, eight or 10 voting periods, people voted and not a single false positive in the log files. So that works. And in the absence of false positive, you start to trust in the alerts because then whenever you have an alert in your log monitor, you know this is an attacker. Because before that, you're never quite sure, is this an attacker? Is it a benign user? Are we doing something wrong? And that period is over. We're entering a whole new level where we don't think twice. There is an alert, it's an attack. And that is a very, very liberal moment, liberating moment, because when you do this, then you can't start to divide and rule. Then you're no longer paying attention. Then you know this IP address is offensive. This client here is an attacker. And now we're going to attack that attacker. We're going to ban the attacker. We're using fail to ban. You're no longer connecting to us. We no longer accept TCP connection for your IP address. After the first finding. You know what that does to attackers? When you stop talking to them immediately, the first sign of an attack, I mean, somebody wants to exploit you and you're, we're over. Stop talking. That's highly, highly effective. But it means you need to tune down your false positive. And it's really a worthwhile investment. And then you need to go beyond this. So you manage paranoia level four uh, with the CRS. And then you want even more security. So what can you do? You do positive security rule set. CRS is a deny rule set. It's a generic denial rule set. It knows about the bad stuff. It smells SQL and then it rejects requests. Uh, positive security is more like a firewall. Is, a network firewall is configured. It does default deny and then it says the following three requests are okay. With online voting we had eight API endpoints and these were the only URIs that were allowed. And from this endpoint you do post and here you do get and if you mix the two then you're out. Out as in fail to ban. So no playing around with our endpoints here. No invention of fuzzying of uh, parameter names. No, these are the 28 parameters that we know and you're not trying them out. And that parameter name is, an, is a digit. And if you're trying a letter, you're out, you're banned for an hour. So uh, it's highly effective. Actually, it was so effective that for the bug bounty, we had to disable fail to ban because government said, if you're doing that, you're pissing off the testers, and then we'll get bad press. So we had to f uh, switch off the fail to ban. With default deny, you list uh, the allowed resources. You can go as deep as you want. And with that, reduce the attack surface, of course, because you're building a default deny wall, as in a castle, and then you open tiny arrow slits where you accepting requests. Good. And then, as I said, you, ha you have all the means to identify the attackers now, and then you divide and rule, and you apply fail to ban or some other harsh measure to keep them off your services. What else uh, can you or could you do? You could monitor the flow of your application. Uh, mod security and CRS is not doing that. It's purely a request based. So new request starts from scratch. Unless we apply fail to ban, starting from zero again, start with our detection. And of course, we could combine requests. We could follow sessions. We could say, hey, why do you access this endpoint if you haven't accessed that endpoint first? So you could uh, follow the flow of the application. Uh, there is no rule set, uh, as far as I can tell, because I'm no longer working for them, that does that. You could time and see and monitor the rhythm of a client they're doing, highly effective. Both things, you would probably need to apply additional measures beyond mod security, like branch out to Lua code that is very well supported and do lots of additional stuff. I'd be really interested for somebody to do this or provide a framework to do this in, uh, 
in mod security combining with Lua, but I haven't seen this happening. And you can do client fingerprinting, which is also very interesting. And, and then you go beyond mod security, uh, you need an application of uh, an application layer, denial of service, prevention. Uh, WAF can help you there. Uh, probably need to do this in front of the WAF uh, or with very good tools. Unfortunately, mod security is not very good when it comes to denial of service prevention. Uh, quality of service stuff, you can do this in Apache. It's better in front of Apache. You could do it at IP reputation, DNS blacklisting. And if you happen to be in a small country like Switzerland, then GeoIP happens as well. Of course, if you want to do this for foreign voters, then GeoIP is a bit of an contradiction. That's why that hasn't happened. Good. Uh, so let me sum this up before we come to the end and you're released for lunch. Uh, the OWASP Mod security coral set at paranoia level four is a baseline. If you want to get serious about high security setups that you want to, want to apply in front of your application, you can do a complementary positive security rule set to raise uh, security even higher. In fact, uh, positive security works very well for APIs and not so well for free text. While a CRS doesn't work so nicely for APIs, but it works fairly well for free text applications. And you have the two combined, then they're kind of complementary. So it's a good combination to run. You want application level DDoS, QS, and as I said. So that brings you the high security WAF. Look up the resources I shared on Twitter uh, if you want to dive deeper into this. And if you're interested, this is how you find me. I can guide you, I can help you. And I'm running regular courses on mod security and the code rule says. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Christian. Is there any question? Yes. Usual suspect in the second exactly. row. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, out of curiosity, the yes. fact that you are using this fail to ban approach uh, to block uh, attackers uh, after like the first request or even not the first but after like few malicious requests isn't like a problem i mean uh, if i i don't know let's say i buy a malicious uh, advertisement advertisement company on a newspaper let's say an online newspaper and then i throw some requests through javascript uh, from the browsers of the users to your uh, online team, online voting system basically i deny the service to everyone yes that is okay. a problem. That <laughs> That's is a not problem. a problem. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, we would notice, and then we disable filter pen. Okay. And I then mean, we go that, after That's something the you would disable in that case. Though. Yeah, I mean, we're monitoring the fail to ban. Okay. And if the fail to ban would, in production, one attacker per day, because who's attacking Swiss online voting system? Relatively few people do that. So we would see very few fail to ban activations in production. And then with suddenly thousands of IP addresses, then, hey, all the alarms go off. What is happening there? And then you see, hey, look, we have a problem here. And there is an important uh, thing about the US. I mean, dosing an internet voting system means you stop the election. And uh, an important detail is the online, the electronic voting stops one day ahead. So when the system collapses, you can still go to the voting office. And that was a very important dial of service and defense that doesn't work for foreign voters, but it works very well for local voters where you say, hey, look, this is always open. For four weeks, you can do electronic voting, but on Saturday, it's over. And you didn't manage to vote. If the system died, if your browser died, or whatever happened, you go to the voting office on Sunday and you still do your vote. So the malicious attacker, uh, Abusing fail to ban is not really a real world scenario that we took very care of because it wouldn't be so bad. <laughs>